Hi, welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm David Robson. I'm a horticulturalist and pesticide specialist here at the University of Illinois on one of these cold winter days. And with us today are a bunch of horticultural specialists. We're here to answer all of your questions, provi uh, provide some good information, hopefully have a good time. We're gonna go ahead and get started, introduce the panel. They're gonna have a question. They'll tell you a little bit about their specialty. First up, Bill Erickson. Bill. Oh, thank you, yes, uh, I'm a landscape architect uh, here in the area and I uh, specialize in residential design and um, anything that has to do with the landscape in your yard, including water gardens and attracting wildlife to the yard, uh, be glad to help you with. And you have some questions, Bill? Right. We've, a we've, question? Right. We've yes. got a question um, here about uh, a cattail invasion. And um, this is uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Illinois area here in uh, Spring Lake uh, subdivision. And um, they have problems with cattail springing up along the shoreline. They're wondering how to get rid of them. This is a very difficult problem because cattails are very persistent and hard to get rid of. There's two options that you'd have. There's the chemical treatment route, uh, and that you'd use an aquatic uh, uh, glyphosate uh, product. Uh, it's like Roundup that you can use in water, and um, that's sprayed directly on the foliage of the plants. To do that uh, yourself, you have to be aware of state regulations. Uh, sometimes if you're a homeowner's association, you have to have a member who has passed exams in order to treat the plants. A private homeowner has to get a permit uh, from the state. So you have to be aware that, that that's involved. It's also very costly. Um, you can use as many as 100 gallons of chemical on one acre of cattails uh, to treat them and, and it can get into the thousands of dollars. So the other option is a physical removal of the cattails and uh, that can be done and if you're persistent at it, you can get rid of them. You wanna remove the plants right below the water line and keep them underwater if possible uh, the best uh, uh, equipment to do that with is a gas-powered weed eater. It's called an uh, aquatic uh, vegetation groomer, and it has a metal blade on it. You can stick it under the water, and it'll cut the cattails off. It's gas-powered. Don't use electric tools near the water. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, once you've done that, you can, you can rake it up. There's other tools available, uh, many things online that you can get for cleaning up uh, the edges of the pond. So um, I would probably recommend the physical removal approach. It's going to be less costly and uh, probably uh, a little bit less um, hassle to get the uh, required uh, permits and things. Uh, one of the things I heard is when you do the mechanical, you don't let it get very tall before you start cutting it off too. So I, right. you don't want to give it energy to regrow right. with. Yeah, once you've cut it down, you <laughs> want to keep it uh, cut down it can't get any food to the roots to the roots that way uh, because the foliage is gone and it also uh, can't get oxygen. So those are the two things that eventually will kill it. Great, Bill, good information. We have cattails in a lot of our water sources here in Illinois and the permitting is something that I know that people need to always consider uh, and that's usually with the Illinois EPA or the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Right. Teresa Mears, welcome, my good friend. Well, welcome. Glad to be here. This is always a fun night. So It is. Yeah, it's a good way to start the year. I'm Teresa Mears. I'm a horticulture instructor out at Parkland College, and I have a specialty kind of in indoor plants, greenhouses, and just a little general horticulture knowledge all over. Pruning, trees, shrubs, and even turf grass. I have a question from a viewer about turf grass, and it was actually a reply to something I had brought up on the show. Um, we use a lot of Kentucky bluegrass here as our standard lawn grass, but technology and breeding, we have come around with a tall turf type fescue, which actually takes about as much energy to get established as a bluegrass lawn, but actually tolerates our hot, dry summers a little better. And so it makes a nice alternative. And I've been seeing several brands of grass that are now blending the bluegrass with the tall fescue. So when you sow your grass seed, you're getting a mixture of the two, which is great because always one's gonna look good. The key piece to watch for is with the Kentucky, uh, with the tall fescue grass, 
the old original parent was Kentucky 31. So if the bag of grass seed, when you read what is actually in it on the label, says Kentucky 31, put it back on the shelf and walk away. Get another one. There's several companies, Pennington, um, Scott's, different ones have good quality turf grass. You get what you pay for. If you buy a cheaper one, you're going to get the old pasture style grass that you don't want. But it's a nice grass. It's got the same shades of blue-green as our bluegrass. It blends right in. And it just helps keep your lawn looking good all year round with less work. I wish they'd get rid of that Kentucky 31 forever and ever so people don't get confused with I do too. Kentucky bluegrass term and then that It's old not even a good pasture grass. No. It it's just so needs to go away. Absolutely. They must have absolutely. stockpiles of it or something. Some, or somebody has a good uh, Some, money something's interest going. into it. Yes. But it's just a matter of physically reading the label when you're at the store. And yes. That's what you got to do is just physically read the label. Thank you very much. And another good friend from way, way, way back for yeah. a long time, more than half my life, Jim <laughs> Schuster. Hi. I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired uh, University of Illinois plant pathologist and horticulturist. And Dave and I did work on the pesticide team together. Uh, my uh, question I've got is the person planted a peach tree in the spring of 2013. It flowered in 2014, had two little peaches, but it never broke dormancy in 2015. Your tree basically died, <laughs> which is why it never leaped out. Uh, but why did it die? Uh, it could have been planted too deep and never really established itself. It could have been the weather, such as the wet spring or summer of 2013, followed by a very cold, lack of snow winter. And depending on the kind of peach tree you bought, hardiness does vary quite a bit in the kind of variety. And basically, unless you're living in very southern Illinois or in Georgia, we don't really push too many peaches for Illinois at all, unless you're finding the most hardiest varieties, which also aren't the best fruiting varieties. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you do want a peach tree, uh, reconsider finding a more hardy variety, making sure you plant it at the correct depth and in good drainage. Uh, it does like moisture, but it doesn't like want wet feet. So uh, you don't want to have it go through a prolonged drought, nor do you want to <laughs> have it sitting in water. Thanks, Jim. Great information. Before we get to the phones, we are going to go to our Do You Know or Did You Know video about cicadas. You can hear the cicada song for up to a half a mile away, and they only sing during the daytime. The cicada makes the loudest sound of any insect. That would almost make you think that cicadas are fun things to have, and I know most of us find them kind of annoying. Um, but they're nice, great creatures. Uh, sometimes you call them locusts. Uh, they usually come out during the summer. With that, we're going to go to line two, and Janet, she has a question about lupine sowing. Yes, I was wondering if uh, lupine can be sown wildly, just thrown in the grass. And if it will grow in this part of the state and also in northern Wisconsin and Minnesota, can it just be thrown on the, uh, in the roadway and all it would take hold? A bad question. Bill, do you have a potential answer to that? Well, it's not uh, commonly found that I am aware of here. So uh, my suspicion is that it's not very happy in, in this area. I have seen some lupine in the Springfield area. Uh, I want to say it's a biennial. It is. And therefore, it has to make it through that first winter. And a lot of times, if you think about lupine, it's more of a mountainous plant. So it really likes the cooler summers and what we get. And when it gets really too hot, it gets leggy, it dries out. And in the spring, if it gets too hot too quickly, it tends to be elongated as opposed to that uh, stacking up it's of the flower, that dense floral head. I'd say it's been maybe 12, 15 years ago. I was very successful with lupine for about four years in a row. And then it kind of petered out and I've not had any luck at my house. And um, I had it on the east side of a garage, so it never got the hot afternoon sun, which was the big key piece. Right. Yeah, so like you said, it has to be cool, and it's not the happiest camper here. Well mulched, moist water, but it is a true biennial, so the first year you're not going to see much. And maybe when she said 
she was close to Wisconsin, that might give it a little bit cooler condition. Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. They still get 90 degree yeah. temperatures yeah, I was up in there. Northern yeah. Illinois. It I got know, hot. Jeff, you were there all the time. Okay, line three. Mike and a question about weather and trees. Hey, David, this is your old friend Mike from Springfield. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Hey, what's this kind of winter do to those trees, especially the young trees, where like today it's 53, Sunday they're predicting a temperature of 7 and 9 degrees. Uh, is there anything we got to worry about? Yeah, Jim, I'm going <laughs> to go to you because yeah. diseases and trees and cold weather yeah. reads yeah. Jim Schuster. Well, I, the, the freezing and thawing, the rapid freezing and thawing is going to be hard on the trunk of the tree, especially the, the smoother the bark. So trees that are like crab apples and that, they're going to be very, very prone to having their bark crack. The sun will warm them up, and even when it's like today is 50 and the sun on it, it warms it up and then it, you know, tonight it's not going to get that cold. Let's say on Sunday when we're going to be dropping down into single digits, if it drops too fast, that bark will shrink and pull away and rip, and that exposes the inside of the tree to cankers and wood rot and things like that. So you do have to be really concerned about this rapid uh, freezing and thawing that we're having uh, fluctuation in this temperature. Uh, one of the things that can help reduce that is buy yourself some cheap indoor white la latex paint, mix it with nine parts of water, and go out and paint the south and west side of the trunk, and that'll help reflect the sunlight so it doesn't get too warm when we're having those hot, I mean, the cold days where the sun just brings it up just enough to thaw it, and then the clouds come by or the night temperatures hit and refreezes the trunk. So uh, consider that. It doesn't look very nice, but after two or three years, you can stop it and just let it wear off and by that time, the bark on the tree will be thick enough that it should be able to tolerate the colder winter. Do we think the cold's going to have any effect on the flower buds on some of these trees, yeah. or shrubs even? I, I think so. It, you think so too? Uh, some of the, uh, some of well, the it, buds well, have been it's, swelling. It's, yeah, you got the swelling of the buds, so it's the warmth that's actually hurting, followed by this cold. If we were going to get warm and stay warm, we'd be okay, but we're not going to do that. Right. And got, I, keep an eye on the bud. When the scales actually start to separate, the bud is going to definitely freeze it out. As long as the scales are overlapping and it's just, it's just mm -hmm. a slight swelling, they should survive. But once they separate enough that you can, um, you can tell them in, as individual scales, you're going to be in the tree buds will be in trouble. On the other hand, if you wanted to cut those branches and bring them indoors, they're going to flower very quickly <laughs> as, right. as, as far as forcing goes. That's right. And all of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and in most cases, it will kill the flower bud, but there's usually some buds underneath that, so it's really not going to do that much damage. Well, the leaf buds are hardier. The leaf buds are hardier on that. And mm -hmm. I know maples are another one besides the apples uh, that crack. you have mm -hmm. that crack, that frost mm -hmm. crack to yeah. it. Yeah, and just think of any tree that's really smooth bark are the ones that you got to worry about the most. Especially your smaller calipers. Yeah, and right, and under yeah. two inches. Right. Yeah. And I guess sycamore <coughs> trees, I remember hearing them crack in the park across from me, but they have that thin bark or that mm -hmm. smooth yeah. bark most of the time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, since we don't have any calls at the moment, Bill, I guess we're going to go back to our second okay. uh, emails that we have. Right. Uh, I've got an email from uh, Kathy, and she has a uh, trumpet vine Actually, it's next door to her house, and uh, she's having problems with suckers coming up in her yard, and that's not surprising. Uh, that's one of the most invasive type of plants that you can have in your landscape. Um, it spreads in three different ways, and uh, it spreads by seed, uh, rerooting from branches that touch the ground, and also underground by suckers. And uh, one of the methods that's probably the easiest to use if it's coming up in the lawn is just to keep uh, repeatedly mowing it off and uh, keeping it at bay that way. Uh, if it's in a plant bed, it's a little bit harder to control. Uh, you can uh, uh, remove the plant entirely. Uh, it's probably the best solution, but if you want to keep it, uh, there are ways that uh, you can trench around the roots and put in a liner to keep suckers from uh, uh, coming up elsewhere in the yard. You'll have to go very deep though, probably three feet or so uh, with that rubber liner in order to keep that from happening. You want to prune the plant back repeatedly. You want to deadhead the flowers uh, uh, before they turn to seed. Don't let the plant go to seed. Um, and then uh, other methods might be covering the area with black uh, visqueen, 
uh, as a last resort and just smothering it out. But uh, it's a very uh, aggressive plant and you have to be prepared for that if you're gonna put it in the landscape. You do, I mean, they sell it as a hummingbird plant right. and it does attract the hummingbirds, but they don't tell you that, yes, it goes here, there, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we will take your telephone calls. Call us at 217-333-3495. That's 217-333-3495. We know it's cold outside, but there's still a lot of gardening that can be going on. And with that, Teresa, you have a question about chrysanthemums. Yes, I have a uh, person that purchased two chrysanthemums from the same location. She bought them at the same time. One was a yellow flower, one was a purple flower, a burgundy flower. And um, after about two weeks, the, um, were, they were looking nice, but all of a sudden the burgundy flower plant lost all of its flowers. They all turned black. Even the new buds that hadn't opened yet were turning black and just picked them all off. The plant seems fine. The leaves have remained healthy, but there's no new buds coming because the way the mum flower creates its buds, it's a couple months ahead of time from when you get it. And mm -hmm. they don't keep making b new buds like an annual will. So it's kind of hard with the information we have to be definitive what happened, but it could very easily have been some botrytis issue, which is a disease, and it can easily cause the buds to die out. Overhead watering with coolness in the evening or something could have caused the botrytis to set in, and it, would, it could have been very even. And it could have stayed with the way the flower buds are held above the foliage. It could have stayed easily on the flowers. It could have also been the fact that that pot might have gotten a little bit drier, and a plant, when it's in flower, oftentimes will sacrifice the flowers and save the foliage to keep itself alive. So we could have lost the flowers that way. And the very fact that one was yellow and one was burgundy, they may have been two very different varieties. And there might have been some issues with that burgundy variety that as the yellow didn't carry. The yellows tend to be the tougher plants when mums anyway. It's more traditional colors. So. I, it looks like you were just using them as pot containers, not putting them in the ground, so I'm sorry, just get a new one. <laughs> and with those hardy annuals, they really aren't winter hardy no. planted late in the season, so uh, like you said, next year, try them again. Yeah. That's the best you can do. Mm -hmm. Jim, you have a question about things that are a little cute, but <laughs> it, cause well, problems. It depends on your point of view. They're cute, but they cause problems. That's right. Okay. Uh, the per person had heard previous shows about voles, and he complained that these little critters are still eating his vegetables and his grass, and he heard that the female voles may have 100 babies a year. Um, <clears throat> but he also wants to know, um, do we have a good solution? Well, they are not protected by uh, the uh, conservation department. Uh, you can kill them as long as you do it humanely. Um, a good rat trap uh, made it for them will uh, nail them. Uh, but you also got to make sure you don't catch anything else. So you got to be very careful about how you use the rat trap. Um, and um, they, one of the things we recommend is you find the entrance to the bowl entrance set your rat trap and then screen it with the uh, heart, uh, chicken wire. That way uh, it keeps the birds and any other animal from getting at the rat trap. And these do breed in heavy numbers. So just because you kill one or two doesn't mean you got the whole family. And the, uh, one of the other things you can do is destroy their habitat. They love tall grasses, whether that's grass along a river bank, uh, railroad tracks, or in your flower beds and you've got ornamental grasses, or it could be, you know, you're growing a lot of pr tall perennials. That's the kind of stuff they love. Um, and you can find their trails in the winter as, as you know, we're, this year you can find it right now because we haven't had any snow. When we have snow, you, uh, as it melts, you can find the trails that they use uh, running back and forth from where they live to where they've been feeding. And by the way, you mentioned that you were getting them on your flowers and your vegetables. They also eat the bark off of trees and shrubs and, and can kill them. So it's important, especially in the wintertime, that you uh, maybe use some chicken wire or uh, actually hardware cloth around the trunk to keep them from chewing on that bark. Uh, this year with the mild winter, 
they may not be feeding on the trunks of your trees because they can find other food. Um, but when it's a heavy snow, if we should get some good snow and they have to tunnel through it, then they're going to look for the easier things to find, which is the bark of your trees and shrubs. So uh, chicken wire, uh, a hardware cloth, which quarter inch mesh on the trees and shrubs that you want to keep. And then, um, you know, you can start looking for their holes and trapping them that way. And maybe a good outdoor cat or an owl every now and then. It's not going to be that bad either. That's right. Absolutely. Okay, let's go back to our phone lines. Line number two, Charles, a question about tree suckering. Yes, hi. Thanks for taking the call. We cut down a bunch of big, giant tree of heaven last year. <laughs> okay. And uh, they are throwing suckers up all over the place throughout the yard. And I'm wondering if there's something we can do to the stump or treat that other than just cutting them off at the root to try to control that. Sucker control well, panel. There's, there's nothing heavenly about the tree of heaven <laughs> <laughs> to start with. Will it grow any place? Any place, anywhere, right. and continues all the time. Right. It's like a mulberry tree. <laughs> It's going to always mm -hmm. have it. And it's being very diligent. Um, you can, after you make your cuts, you can do some painting to the wound with some, um, I'd buy something stronger than the Roundups, get an actual brush killer that's a little more toxic. Uh, okay. I have used, and I've used it on a smaller suckers on an actual living tree, and it's called Sucker Stop. And it's actually, I don't remember what the chemical was, but it was just in a spray bottle and you made your wound and you sprayed it. And it was a uh, silver maple that was just suckering so the base of the tree had looked like a shrub. And it worked really well. I'd only have to trim the tree once a season rather than three or four times. And wasn't there also a product out there called Stump Killer so when you cut the tree off, you could paint the stump and that would help but reduce it? But the tree, if the stump's been cut for a while, you're not going to have right, it right. affected. But when right. you do it does more. Yes. Right. But, um, it's it's just being very diligent and trying to do and if you can if you can dig down a little deeper where those smaller suckers are coming from and pull up more of the root with it you're going to get more of it. it it's it's not fun but it is what it is you keep at it yeah well, keep at and, it and there's one more option they can move <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. So you there's, well there, there's another um, option that you could try is to to do in ground containers with uh, uh, a glyphosate product and put the tip of the branch in the glyphosate, um, it's best to have a clear plastic lid that you can cut a slit in, put the tip of the branch in, and that way it's getting a prolonged exposure to the chemical, and that's sometimes effective for real stubborn uh, suckering. Great. Thank you, panel. <laughs> and I always want to mention, make sure you read and follow oh, the yeah. directions on every label of any product that you're going to use that's a pesticide. Okay, Gay, line four has a question about maple tree roots, which may be very similar to the other things we've talked about. Go ahead, Gay. Gay. Yes, I have a tree, a maple tree in my backyard. It's 43 years old, and the roots are really up at the top, you know, coming up high, and they're two and three inches deep in places, the knobs on the roots. Is there any way you can cut those off horizontally that won't harm the tree or not? Not, not really. Maple trees, especially a silver maple, tends to be high rooted, and that's why they were always nasty to have along sidewalks because they would break the sidewalks up and damage them. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, your best bet is, is to put some mulch over top of those, and that way you keep the mower away from them. And if you put enough mulch, then you're not tripping on them, you're not stepping on them, being uncomfortable. And mulch really won't hurt the roots because you're not going to bury them that deep. And it's loose enough material. But you don't want to be damaging too many of those roots. Those are the important roots that the plant's still getting its water and its nutrients from. So, I mean, it, it's, it is what it is. It's just the nature yeah, mm -hmm. of the tree. Mm -hmm. Of a silver maple. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we have time for another question. Fred on line five. I think it's about peonies. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I have a peonies bush. In fact, I have a couple of them in my front yard. And uh, last for the last two years, they've been getting some kind of a powdery substance on them, and then the leaves kind of wilt up, and uh, then they don't produce anymore for the rest of the summer. 
Is there anything I can do about that? Okay, quickly. Well, if it's brown, it's, you know, it can be anthracnose or it can be uh, botrytis. If it's white, it's powdery mildew. There are fungicides for all of them, and you want to spray preventively. Uh, powdery mildew doesn't need uh, moisture, it just like, needs high humidity. The other two, the anthracnose and the powdery, uh, botrytis, uh, want moisture. And so uh, the more it rains or the more dews you have or the more overhead water you do, the more likely you're going to uh, pr uh, promote that. So you will want to start as soon as the plants are about an inch or two out of the ground, you're going to want to start the fungicide treatment and you'll tr continue that pretty much through most of the summer. And of course, make sure you remove the foliage at the end of the right. year, sanitation, fresh mulch, things along that line. And if you do get the disease, uh, don't compost it. Great. Thank you guys for joining us and thank you for joining us today on Mid-American Gardener. Have a great rest of the winter and enjoy gardening.